You're listening to The Other 50%, A History of Hollywood. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. This is the podcast where I talk to successful women in entertainment and hear their stories. For this episode, I sat down with Sonia J.F. Barnett, Canada's only IPA-certified intimacy coordinator. Sonia has been working in the field of sexuality for over 10 years. She founded Toronto's esteemed Keyhole Sessions as a safe and welcoming community for artists to experience the union between sex and art. In early 2011, she co-founded Slut Walk as a way to combat victim-blaming and sexual profiling filing for which she was named one of Utney Reader's top visionaries. She recently completed a specialist degree in sexual diversity studies at the University of Toronto and is pursuing her master's degree in counseling psychology with a focus on sex therapy. She is also a feminist erotic filmmaker with her short films touring world festivals and each winning multiple awards. A certified sexual health educator, Sonia is also part of the LGBTQIA2S plus community and is kink friendly. She is currently working as an intimacy coordinator on Guillermo del Toro's upcoming feature film, Nightmare Alley, and C, season two for Apple TV+. I met Sonia on the live series Catch a Break podcast produced with Greenslate called The Way Back, where we talked about getting back to production in the time of COVID. You can see that series at catchabreakpodcast.com or gslate.com. It is worth the watch or listen. As you might suspect, we are going to be having a grown-up talk about sex and sex education and some porn, and you can decide whether or not to listen in your car if your kids are there. But here's your warning. Also, as a preemptive correction, I referenced a piece Dan Savage gave talking about porn and the internet, but I called him Fred Savage. (laughs) To my knowledge, Fred Savage hasn't talked about porn on the internet publicly, although we might be interested in what he has to say about it. That was a mistake. It was Dan Savage. And in a wonderful full circle moment, Sonia talks about how hearing Amanda Blumenthal on this podcast led her to seek out and take her training. I love it when a plan comes together and this world is made a little smaller and more connected. You can find us at theother50percent.com for added features, photos, show notes, and the merchandise. You can also listen on Apple Podcasts and all the podcast places. Okay, here's my conversation with Sonia. Have a listen. What do you do? I am a certified intimacy coordinator for film and television. So you are one of how many people who are doing this now? Oh, uh, I could probably count on two hands how many are certified at the moment. Uh, In Canada, I think there are four currently certified ICs. Wow. Mm -hmm. So obviously, this is not what you've been doing for the entire span of your career, because I think this thing only came up fairly recently. So let's talk about your journey in the entertainment industry. Where did you start? And how did you think about getting into it? Uh, Like you said, the the job or the industry of intimacy coordinating is super young. It's only, I don't know, two, three years old in film and television and theater. It's been, I think, around about 10 years. Um, And I have always been an avid uh, film watcher, TV watcher, you know, pop culture, I don't know, succubus, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) And um, I had been wanting to somehow incorporate my sexual health education into um, a more maybe profitable career, I guess. I'm a sexual, I'm also a certified sexual health educator. So I've been doing that for about 10 years or so. Um, and is that what you studied in school? Uh, yeah, my second time around. Yes. So I actually, so I am, how old am I? I'm 47. I think. <laughs> this is what happens in our forties. I'm 40. I don't know what, I don't even remember anymore. Um, <laughs> doesn't so, matter. doesn't matter. No, it really doesn't. Um, if this was video, you could see all my gray coming in. Um, I just uh, last year uh, went to univer- finished university for the second time around for the second career. So I did uh, my undergrad in sexual diversity studies. Um, and that has been kind of helping me along in terms of me becoming a licensed sex therapist. So I'm right now I'm, I'm currently doing my master's in counseling psychotherapy. So I can lump all my information on sexual health together and become a sex therapist. Interesting. Okay. What was your first career? Uh, I was a creative director in design. Oh my gosh. So many things. Yeah. So I went, when I was 19, I went to university to become a graphic designer. I was doing that career for maybe 13, 14 years. And then there was a big pivotal moment in my life in my thirties that kind of shot me away from graphic design and into something and into really the feminist, um, civil rights, social rights, women's rights movement, and that, and then talking about sexuality, which is where I'm most at home dealing with, like the, sex, the cross-section between uh, art and sex. 
that is, that's my wheelbase. Um, so I pivoted into uh, getting into sexual health education and counseling and now in psychotherapy. And also I um, dabbled in feminist erotic filmmaking for a while. And th- that was my own interest. So those all kind of culminated into like this perfect soup of all my interests and all my skills and intimacy coordinating showed up on the horizon. I thought, oh my God, that's perfect. <laughs> that's my jam. Yeah, exactly. Do you want to talk about that pivotal moment in your 30s? What happened? Um, I um, wound up being a co-founder of this uh, feminist movement called Slut Walk. So what had happened um, in 2011, um, there was a, a police safety forum at York University. New York at the time had been my, my was you know my alma mater from very many years ago, and uh, the officer, uh, of course, it, you know it's run by cops. Um, the officer, one of the officers at the time, said, you know, let's just not beat around the bush, and you know, if you don't don't dress like a slut if you don't want to be victimized. So uh, yeah, what, what exactly? So that in two thousand and what uh, eleven? Yeah, exactly. Let's just take, let's just take a breath on that. <laughs> okay, that was the thing is that I had at the time, you know, I had been I uh, was heading up um, a very welcoming, like sexually welcoming art community um, that brought artists together for erotic life drawing sessions. And we were doing photography events and stuff like that. And I was surrounding myself with these really sexually open, sexual positive people at the time. So when I heard that had happened, I thought, what? People still say that? That's right. like, that's a thing? And again, like that was, I realized I had been in this, you know, safer bubble. And the news went from uh, that forum to York University's uh, local uh, student newspaper. And then the Toronto Star picked it up. And the Toronto Star is a national paper up here in Canada. And that's where I read it. That was like a month after it had happened. And so I was on Facebook at the time. Uh, I'm not really on it anymore. But at the time, um, and I was chatting with a friend of mine. I was like, what? Did you hear that this had happened? I have, what is going on? there's no way that this can fly. Like, and I, at the time my teenager was seven. Um, and I thought I can't raise my kid in, you know, an environment where this shit still happens. Right. So then a friend of mine were chatting, a colleague of mine were chatting at the time and we thought, okay, you know what, let's, let's do something about this. Cause she was like, yes, we, you know, we have to do this. So we thought we'd make this stink. You know, we would thought we would grab a few of our closest friends and uh, march down over to Toronto Police Headquarters and make a stink and say, you know, that's not cool. We need to have a conversation, blah, blah, blah. We thought, OK, you know, that'll be our little our little demonstration. And I thought, what better thing to call it than slut walk, you know, throwing the word. Yeah. If he's going to throw the word at us, we're just going to sling it right back uh, and twist it on its head. And so that kind of, you know, Facebook and Twitter at the time were like really rising in terms of community organizing and word spread like wildfire. So we got it to a bunch of our friends and then more friends and their friends. And, you know, it's like that. And so on and so on. I was just going to say that. (laughs) (laughs) They were of the same vintage. That's right. Um, So it it grew into this massive thing. And we thought, okay, I guess, you know, a bunch of people are going to show up at, uh, Queens Park. So it wound up once it turned into a bigger thing. Queens Park is like our local political center, and it's not really that much farther down the road from uh, Toronto Police Headquarters. So we thought, okay, we'll start at Queens Park, we'll march down to uh, headquarters, we'll have a few signs, and then as numbers grew on the Facebook group, uh, we started getting calls from media, and it was like first it was local media, and then it was bigger media, and we thought, what is happening? We show up, uh, I think it was April 3rd, uh, 2011, in front of Queens Park. And then all of a sudden, like I turn around, I was talking to, I think, some local reporter. I turn around and there's thousands of people behind me. Oh, my God. It was so weird. And people were coming in by bus from other cities. And uh, Heather, uh, one of the other co-founders, was like, what? What? What are we doing? So I like, had, had this, you prepared. Did you have porta potties? And we did have porta potties. <laughs> we did prepare, and it was kind of one of those things. You know, uh, hindsight is always twenty twenty, right? So if, looking back, I would totally do things differently now, especially sure. now with the way that uh, uh, what's going on with police and police brutality and and, and police police infusion into non police emergencies. 
Um, so once our, our numbers started getting bigger, Toronto police took notice on our Facebook page and they contacted us and said, if you're going to have that many people, one, you need a permit. Uh, and two, you're going to have, you're going to need marshalling. And so you're yeah. not allowed to do this. Uh, and if you're going to have like thousands of people, I think at the time on the Facebook group was like 3000 people. If you have this many people coming, you have to do these. So, it's, so I thought I never protested before. Like I've never been to a protest. <laughs> Suddenly this know, got real. Yeah, things got real. And, you know, as somebody who uh, passes as white, uh, you know, I've certainly had a lot of privilege. I have not had a lot of experience with cops. And we're like, oh, okay, sure. But, you know, just stay away and just, you know, we're not going to interact with you. We do want to talk to the uh, police chief once we get to police headquarters. That was kind of one of our mandates is that we have a conversation about, uh, and at the time, again, it's one of those things that you change in hindsight, uh, reform or, you know, education Mm -hmm. of uh, police and how they deal with um, sexual assault and slut shaming and stuff like that. So then, um, so we thought, okay, so we're going to have a police presence. Um, and once that came about, we thought, okay, we would like our own people to be involved. So a bunch of our friends, you know, my husband, um, you know, boyfriends, they kind of like, they gathered this marshalling herd. My husband, who's a producer, secured like all these walkie talkies. So all our marshals were like fully set up. They had their walkies and they were just walking the route uh, along the edges to make sure everybody was cool. And it was, it was totally great. It was totally fine. They actually wound up turning into like this big celebratory march toward uh, police headquarters. Um, and, you know, there is a backstory there somewhere about police who had infiltrated undercover. And, like there was a whole documentary d- done about it. Like it was this whole thing. I'm, I'm a, like on a police watch list now because we were agitators. Oh my God, a huge success. Yeah, so so anyway, so it turned out to this big thing. We had like 3,500 3, people show up, this giant march in front of police headquarters. We're like, okay, this is great. We had speakers come out, talk about, um, you know, sexual abuse, sexual assault. Uh, we had indigenous speakers. Uh, we had somebody from the Toronto Rape Crisis Center discuss what the problems are in dealing with uh, police and sexual assault. And also, you know, larger institutions like the judicial system and stuff like that. The entire system. Yeah, exactly. The entire system. So we thought, oh, okay, great. And then, you know, it was done and we thought, okay, that was a a lot of work and, you know, we'll see what happens. Maybe there'll be some kind of conversation. Of course, the Toronto police chief refused to talk to us and they had no interest. Um, And then the day after, we started getting even more phone calls and like from media all over the world. We were like New York Times, NBC, ABC, CBS, Al Jazeera, London Times, LA Times, Australian paper, Italian papers calling us from all over the world saying, what have you done? Like, what are you doing? This is amazing. Um, and of course, there were some people really pissed off that we were doing. I said, how dare you lionize slutness and sluttiness and, you know, prostitution and, oh, my gosh, a woman should really know her place. And so much pearl clutching. Yes, so much pearl clutching. <laughs> so there were news interviews all over the place. And it turned into this thing. And then all like these little slut walks, these little groups started calling us from around the world saying, hey, we we'd, we'd like to be a part of this. Can you help us out? You know, what did you do? And We had no idea. And again, like I had no back history and protest and we were just kind of learning as we went. And we said, okay, you know, we have a mandate. You have to be incredibly inclusive Uh, at that. Even at that time, inclusive could have been even more inclusive with our language. You have to, you don't have to reclaim the word slut, but you can't be using it in a derogatory tone because we have to be flinging it back at at these, you know, institutions and stuff like that. So they started popping up all around the world. We started calling them satellite slut walks. And for a while, it was kind of like a bit of a manageable group where people were contacting us. How do we organize? We would give them our experience and say, you know, this worked really well for us. This didn't work well for us. But then it got to be so many. And we realized that it was coming from so many regions that um, we had no experience with. Like we had people calling us from Iran. Like it was like a 17-year-old girl who was who wanted to organize a slut walk in Iran. And I thought, I have... I don't have no idea what your experiences are there or how things are done. You really need to work, uh, try and gather as many people, um, like-minded people that can help you sort through uh, your own tangles that are happening in your own cities. Um, So we kind of stepped away from that and people did their own thing, which was great. You know, some people rebranded, but they all had like the same motion of this can no longer happen. We're not going to put up with this shit anymore. 
And they started popping up all over the place. You know, new, a London slut walk was like, I think like 10,000 people showed up. Um, there was a massive one in Argentina, which I was super proud of because that's my heritage and just like all over the place. And I think it wound up being like close to 300 satellites that emerged over the, the following couple of years. And many of them are still going. Like I see some of them on Facebook Amazing. and I'm like, oh, you go, Slut Walk Hong Kong. Good for you. <laughs> right? So we... It was this amazing moment, but at the same time, it was so exhausting because it was, I was on my phone 24 seven. And like I said, you know, we were, we were getting comments all the time. And then, you know, the shit posts started coming in and people posting on the Facebook group, you know, you're just a bunch of whores. You're just a bunch of sluts. I want, I want you dead. I'm going to do this, this, and this to you and your family. So there was that shit that we were contending with. And at the same time, a lot of women were contacting us and saying, thank you so very much for voicing this. It's, it's not something I, I had ever approached in my own experiences, and I w- really want to talk about it. So then in my other side of my inbox, it was all these really horrendous stories of rape and assault and domestic yeah. abuse. And, oh, it was so draining and exhausting. I thought, oh my God, you poor, you poor people. I wish I could help you more. Like, I feel like I've done nothing compared, right? Like all the, I have been lucky enough that, you know, I've experienced some shit uh, in terms of sexual assault in my life, but not something so, so egregious in, in, compared to some of these stories that I was listening to. Yeah. And with those two sides coming in, it was exhausting. I was on the verge of a nervous breakdown for a while. My a kid who was seven came home, came up to me once and said, Mama, I don't see you anymore. So I realized, oh, okay, that's not a good thing. So I needed to step back. So I stepped back a bit. But also at the same time, I, you know, at that time I looked at it and I was kind of angry and on the defensive. And now in hindsight, again, I, I learned a lot. We also had some really justified uh feedback, negative feedback come up, come back in terms of how really non-exclusive, inclusive we were at times. And the big thing that, that kind of turned it into deeper conversations was there was a slut walk in New York that we were, again, not part of. Um, New York's a much bigger, bigger city than Toronto and they had their own issues and they had a massive walk. And then there was a sign um, carried by a, uh, a young white woman that had a lyric. It's a John Lennon lyric, I think, that said, women are the the N-word of the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and that just, <laughs> that did not go well. And, and of course, it, it shouldn't have. Um, so there was a big divide in terms of who felt included in such a movement. Uh, you know, young white women or uh, BIPOC people who were completely excluded, and especially for black women, you know, I learned a, a ton. Slut is a lot worse than just, you know, a regular slur that somebody who passes as white will get, you know, it's got so many deeper meanings. And, you know, these intersectional meanings of what it all comes about for them, and the violence that 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 word uh, inflicts upon them. So there were big conversations there. And be- because the conversations came from, uh, you know, really deep down on certain sides, uh, some of us took offense and we were on the defense and then they were, they were really angry because of course <laughs> they've been getting it for so much longer, so many years. And so the initial conversations weren't dealt with really well. And I will admit I, I could have, could have done it better, but I learned a, a ton after that. And in all that learning and in, in realizing the exhaustion and the, the worry and the anxiety that something like full-time protest does or being a full-time activist does, I had to step back a bit. So uh, within the year, um, I stepped off. And then over the years, other people have been coming in. So the original five that were part of the uh, the first Toronto group, um, none of us are part of it anymore. Um, but it's being picked up by other women along the way. And it was actually really nice. I was walking through University of Toronto a couple of years ago to get to one of my classes. And I saw a sign on a door saying slut walk poster making event, you know, down the down the hallway. And I thought, oh, my God. Coolest thing. I wanted to go say hi, but it was past the time and they were closed. But it was really nice to see, you know, young people picking up the mantle and it, it's still go- it's still going. And uh, I think what has happened now is that they've aligned with uh, the local sex workers movement, um, mm-hmm. which is fantastic. And I think they've been doing a really good job. So at the time when it was first starting, I was a, an art director at a at a design agency, and that's what I had been doing. And then Slutwalk started shifting. 
uh, my focus. Like I didn't fe- feel like I was doing anything of any worth, you know, making brochures for some, you know, consumerist campaign somewhere. And, uh, you know, I will say great things about my boss at the time. We worked in a very small studio and they realized that my focus was being pulled away from elsewhere work. And because, you know, journalists, I guess props to them, they will hunt you down no matter where you are. So they were calling me at work. I have no idea what, you know, how they would get my number, but of course they do. So they were calling me at work all the time and I was on interviews and radio and TV, blah, 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 all the time. And so they said, look, this is great and we support that you're doing this. This is fantastic, but you really got to choose. Yeah. And I think they actually thought I would choose the work, the design work. And I said, okay. I choose this. So I, I moved over. I, I left that and I thought, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go into more sexual rights work and then, um, try to, try to really educate myself on, you know, movement making and counter movements and feminism, which I had not at the time really aligned myself with that word. And I think a lot of people who grew up in the, in the eighties and early nineties kind of have, or a lot of women, especially white passing women have a real issue with aligning themselves with that word especially after second wave feminism. So I had never really considered myself that. And it was actually the, it was somebody else calling slut walk a feminist movement that I realized, Oh, I guess you're right. It's a feminist. <laughs> I guess it is. So I started moving into that and I started really pushing myself into the erotic uh, art community that I had been running. So I, I went whole hog into that and I was doing events all the time, weekly events and monthly events. And I really enjoyed it. And that community, I didn't expect when I started this life drawing thing, I thought, it's going to be a bunch of people who want to come draw, which I always like to do. And I want to do it. And I want to do really cool artwork. I don't want to do, you know, one boring model standing in the middle of a, of a chair. I want something really hefty and sexy. So, you know, our poses of the models that I would hire were pretty risque. Um, and so the people that would come to that loved it because they didn't really have that kind of exposure to create that kind of art. It was a really safe environment. We're really protective of our models. Um, my models were so fantastic and the community that started building up turned into this huge thing. So people would be coming up to me and saying, thank you so very much for giving me this outlet. Uh, You saved my marriage. You saved my relationship. Uh, I love the way that you talk about sex or you share it or you promote it and you're very sex positive and you're so easy to talk to. And I I guess I'm one of those people that's like, Oh, I'll tell you everything. And I get like, I'll sit next to a stranger (laughs) on the subway and they'll tell me like their dirtiest, darkest secrets. So I realized, "Ah, I think that, I think I might want to be some kind of counselor and involving sex. So that was, that was like kind of the big pivotal shift where I realized I'm going to go into sex therapy and sex counseling because, uh, I'm, I'm clearly good at it. You know, I'm going to toot my own horns. And so work was finding you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that was where, that was when I started shifting. So I started taking, and at the time, even still kind of a little now becoming, a professional in the sex education and sex therapy place doesn't really have a linear flow to it. Sure. You don't, you don't go to school to become a licensed sex therapist. So I was picking up courses and workshops everywhere I could possibly find them and just amalgamating all these kinds of uh, lessons that I was getting. So I became certified sex educator. I did training in San Francisco for two months Um, and then, um, I took a whole bunch of other, I took a sexual attitude reassignment course, uh, workshop. That was a three day intensive course. Then I took, um, intensive sex therapy, uh, course at the university of Guelph. So I started collecting all these skill sets and creating a resume for myself and then realizing this actually, I can move into, um, being a lot better educated if I want to become a therapist. It sounds like the kind of thing that you kind of have to piece it together yourself. Yeah, yeah definitely. You create, you, <laughs> it's not a puzzle. It's like a puzzle from like eight different puzzles that you yeah. kind of mash together into one puzzle and then you just force everything to fit. Um, and that's when I realized if I want, if I want real sexual education, because a lot of people who go for psychotherapy, they don't get sexual health education. They get psychological education. So that's when I decided, okay, in order for me to really beef up my skill set and my knowledge, I'm going to go back to university, which is something I never thought I'd do because I hated it so much the first time. Oh, God, I hated school the first time. But I thought, oh, fuck, I guess I I have to do it. And I live 
down the road from the University of Toronto, which um, is considered one of the best schools in the world. Um, and <laughs> like a beautiful campus. Uh, you know, it's got its issues, you know, best school in the world based on, you know, academic um, yeah. uh, criteria. Uh, but it's got this absolutely beautiful campus. And I would drive by it or walk by it all the time thinking, I, it, I should go there. Look how lovely it is. And they actually have a sexual diversity program, which is one of the few in the world. Not a lot of, again, not a lot of universities or colleges office, offer that. So I got admitted. And it was one of the best experiences of my life. I did it in three years. I went like right through the summers and oh, I learned so much and I sucked up so much information. It was really nice is that the core group of us, it was actually a pretty small cohort, um, is all LGBTQ plus. So mm -hmm. we were, I was like, again, in this perfect little queer, happy bubble. Um, and it was the best thing that I did for three years. And now again, so I'm, I, I graduated last year and uh, I'm moving into um, my master's in counseling psychotherapy. So I'm going to be mashing those two programs together for sex therapy. Gosh, like what a journey to figure out. It feels like in finding this passion, it's a recognizing of what you're passionate about, what you're interested in, all the different facets of it. But also I think it takes a very special type of person who's able to talk about sexuality in a very frank, plain way. Yeah. Right. Definitely. And I, and I think that's a pretty unique skill set just from people I talk to and intimacy coordinators that I've talked to and people who are able to talk that way. It's, it's striking to me because it is very different from how the general population talks about. Yeah. Sex, sex is still so taboo. Yeah. And so to recognize that in yourself of, oh, this is my jam and I can talk about it and I want to work in it. So then let me figure out how to get as much education as possible to do the most good I can. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that one of my, in becoming a sex educator, one of the reasons I did it is because I grew up with Latin American parents who were incredibly hot for each other, but would not talk about sex or lust or relationships or anything with their kids. You know, we're, a, I'm a four kids. And Catholic? Uh, uh, no, actually. Funnily enough, um, mm. I went to a Catholic grade school because, and my my, my father can't stand organize or couldn't stand organized religion. But I went to a Catholic grade school because it, my parents were told when we moved into the neighborhood that that was the best school to go to. And of course, it ruined me for years. You know that Catholic. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you are you Catholic? <laughs> I went to Catholic high school. <laughs> so I know about it, but I'm not Catholic. I had like Catholic guilt for so long. But I was also a really sexual person from a very young age. And I had nobody to talk to about it. I never got the the talk um, from my parents. So I learned about sex the hard ways. I had some really good experiences and I had some really shitty experiences. And I vowed when I grew up that if I was going to have a kid, they would not go through that same bullshit. So my kid, my uh, team from a very young age has been given uh, sexual health information. From the moment he could ask a question, I gave him an, an honest answer. And because it was so open like that, like anytime he asked, it's like, yeah, all right. And we kind of move on because I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to turn it into the talk to make, yeah. you know, to make him feel so uncomfortable. But there's a, there's a thing happening. You just normalize it. So my kid has grown up in an exceptionally sex positive, sexually open house with that kind of education. And so now I feel like, okay, I did my bit as, uh, as a parent. You did your part. I did my part. Now, this is juxtaposed with, and tell me if Canada is different. I got something from my local school district about sex education and whether or not I wanted to allow my child to participate in sex education. And I'm like, what? why would you not? Like, why do people want to withhold just the basic sexual health education from their children? It just, we see so clearly what problems happen when no one is educated about it. You know, men in Congress think, I don't know what they think, but they don't know how any of it works, right? Yeah. Like, what do, you, what do you make of that? It's so infuriating. <laughs> and you would think that, you know, in 2020, okay, you know, in 2019, since 2020 has already proven to be such a shit show, up until 2019, it's like, oh my God, why are we still having these stupid conversations where you can opt out of sex education? And yes, we, we have it in Ontario. Like, Ontario is actually... Um, you know, for your American listeners, Canada is divided into provinces and territories like states, mm -hmm. um, and Toronto's in Ontario. And um, 
Ontario revamped its sex ed curriculum a couple of years ago, and it was like 20 years old. Um, and it didn't have anything about the internet or porn education, you know, how to be a good porn viewer, it didn't have anything about abortion. It was all really just the basic plumbing stuff. And uh, done at a much later age, really when it's too late for a lot of kids, because kids experiment yeah. when they're really early, when they're really young. So that was overhauled, and there was a big stink about that being overhauled. And oh my God, what are we teaching our children to masturbate and to become queer when they're four? <gasps> you know, again, there's the pearl clutching. So there was like there was pushback, and there was enough pushback by a, a small but le- very vocal minority who actually managed to shelve that curriculum that was two years in the making with something like two thousand parents and consultants. <laughs> that disappeared for a couple of years, and then we got a new government. Government, and then it, it was finally put back in, and then again with more pushback. And now our our PM Doug Ford, who is just like this conservative, as my father says, he has the uh, my father, my husband says he has the eyes of a shark because they're just black. <laughs> that he's also now so freaked out about what are we teaching our kids from such a young age? What we're going to tell them that they have penises or vulvas when they're five years old? God forbid! So. But again, there was another pushback, but enough of a pushback that they kept that curriculum. But there are some, you know, uh, modifications, which are really regressions into the older curriculum. Um, And from what I understand, you can opt out. The parents do have an option of opting out. And a lot of parents did, um, especially in the Muslim community. There was a movement to um, opt out and teach kids themselves so you know there's a whole uh, understandably so there's like a cultural difference in terms of how you really deal with sexuality but the catholic schools weren't ready to deal with it and with the public schools the teachers were but you know the administration wasn't Um, so we are still falling into this category of you know where where do babies come from still a lot of people don't don't know how you know the basic reproductive systems work or you know and now that kids are growing up in a much more open environment they have access to the internet if you have access to the internet you really don't need the school curriculum and learning more about lgbtqi aa plus um, education is really important and if you're going to be having that kind of conversation with a kid then you should be able to offer it in your school so but at the now at the moment even in high school like as soon as you get to high school you only have to take one in Ontario you only have to take one health education credit so that's one class in your entire four or five years of high school and you can pick at any time so you're either picking you know regular gym mm-hmm. um, or track and field or something like that and not a lot of kids are picking sexual health education so they're leaving school with no sexual health education past grade eight and when you're a teenager wow that's going to be really detrimental so that's why, uh, you know, and you're seeing it a lot in the states. You're seeing an increase in um, unwanted abortions uh, or unwanted, pre- well, unwanted abortions, unwanted pregnancies. Abortion is usually wanted. <laughs> a rise in STI rates and, ter- and gonorrhea, chlamydia, um, HPV, uh, HIV. I think, uh, you know, Pence was instrumental in increasing the HIV rate in a state. <laughs> because, Good job. Because of reducing access to education. And I think you only have like 18 states are mandated to have comprehensive, scientific-based sex education. So you can call sex education a program, but you can do whatever the fuck you want. Like you can teach only oh, abstinence, yeah. and that's your sex education. Or you. Well, our it. local school had a lot of um, is a public school, and a lot of the uh, sex ed unit had was very religious. In how, uh, you know, the attitude about when and how to have sex. And it was all very, very religiously influenced. Yeah. Um, okay. So then I, I know we're, we're still not talking about entertainment, but. Sorry, still, I think, <laughs> No, no, no. I think, I, I think it's, it's a delicious conversation that needs to be had. So then if kids aren't learning about it in school, they're learning about it from porn. Yes. And if they're learning about it from whatever free porn is out there, that a lot of it is just really awful. So I'm interested because you said you had you had made some of that yourself. Tell me tell me about that. Um, I started uh, shooting porn because I wasn't seeing the porn that I wanted to see myself. And like you said, a lot of it is is garbage. Um, and you know, there's 
what's known as the mainstream porn world, which is like the traditional stuff that most people see um, and is promoted in certain ways and is the easiest, most accessible type of porn you'll see on the internet. Um, and that just an, was not my thing. Um, I'm, well, and I heard Fred Savage talking about it once because he talked about how he talked about that to his teenage son. And he said, if, if the internet was a person, it really doesn't like women. Yeah, definitely. And so, and that is reflected in all of that. So then it, I think it gives people such a skewed sense of how this is all supposed to work. Yeah. So I just thought I can't, I can't keep watching porn if this is what it's going to be. And at the time I had seen like one short randomly in the internet somehow, I think I discovered it on like, it was, uh, it was an advertisement for a camper hotel in Europe. And, uh, you know, Europe has these very interesting ideas and about uh, nudity and sexuality on television and stuff. And they're a lot more open in certain ways. Oh, sure. Prime time. Yeah. Nudity, all nudity. Network television. <laughs> so uh, one of the directors of this series of shorts that were advertising this hotel uh, is a woman named Erica Lust. And she's now huge. Um, she actually, she's based in Spain and she's a big uh, erotic producer and distributor. So I saw this really beautiful short that she had done. It wasn't it wasn't explicit or anything like that, but it was like really lusty and sensual, and it looked beautiful. It was so rich, and the colors and the costuming. It it's not the stuff that you normally see in porn. Like there was a real attention to detail paid, and that's the kind of porn that I wanted to watch. So I thought, ah, fuck it, I'm not going to see it. I'm going to make it myself. So there's a co-op a sex shop in Toronto called uh, Good for Her, and they have been running. Um, the Feminist Porn Awards. Uh, I think last year was their tenth year, and I thought I'm gonna I'm gonna submit to that. I'm gonna make a little porn short. We're gonna have fun, and I'll submit to it and see because that the ha- the submission gave me a deadline to actually do it because it had been in my rolling around in my brain for so long. But the sub- the submission meant okay, you actually have to do it. Mm-hmm. So I uh, and I didn't have a big camera. I didn't want a big crew because I wanted it to be a lot more intimate um, and not obtrusive with all this big equipment and all this shit around. So I grabbed a close friend of mine who was one of the models from my life drawing sessions, who was really gung ho and she's fantastic. And I said, do you want to do porn? She's like, yeah, I want to do porn. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'm going to grab my phone because I, my iPhone, iPhones at the time were their cameras were becoming quite something. And we're going to shoot it on my phone. And it's going to be really short and intimate. And one of the big things for me was that the sound quality in porn is really bad and the dialogue is really bad. It's all cheesy and stuff. So I thought I'm going to, I'm going to not have to deal with any of that. And I also, you know, you can't sync sound on an iPhone or maybe you can now, but, um, so I'm going to shoot it music video style. I'm just going to put a track over top and that's going to be it. So it was a really saucy music video with one woman in it, getting herself off and we had a lot of fun doing it. And then I thought, okay, you know, I'll edit it. And this is kind of cute little short. And I submitted it and we submitted it. It was accepted and we won an award. And that was so exciting for us. And I thought, wow, I really enjoyed doing that. I think I'm going to do it again. So I, I did two more shorts after that, you know, consecutively over three years. And once my first one got submitted and accepted and it won, there are a lot of um, people that come from other festivals to scout at local festivals. So I, then I got picked up by the Berlin Porn Film Festival. And then just kind of word kind of gets around. And all these types of festivals are, you know, feminist porn or what's also known as ethical porn. So it's a lot of it is made with the performer's input. And I always make sure that any footage that I've done, the performers get the final say on what I'm showing because I don't want to show anything that they don't want to show. We do it based on their own time and their own comfort. So they're involved from the start in terms of what's going to be produced. So that's kind of like the ethical aspect of it. And it's very uh, sex positive, body positive, you know, shape, color, uh, ability, uh, uh, sexual identity, all that kind of thing that's involved in ethical or feminist porn. So it kind of made it start, my film started meeting, making these rounds around the world in these little festivals. And it was so lovely. And the people involved are so great and welcoming. And the conversations are so expansive. And it blew my mind, all the stuff that I was learning about sexuality and queerness, which I had never, I had never really totally welcomed my queerness. I, I now I identify as bi, but I never had that kind of experience growing up. And it was, it was not something that you talked about. So I kind of I guess I like really hit it deep inside me. Not that I was really all that ashamed of it. 
it never stopped me from doing what I wanted to do, but I w- didn't openly vocalize it. And then getting into this community of, you know, being very open about your sexuality and actually putting it on screen or producing it in a way with other performers that help you tell your story was really enlightening for me. Um, and Dan, I was in Dan Savage's uh, festival a couple of times. Um, it's actually streaming right now in their, in their COVID greatest hits uh, <laughs> festival, which is really nice. So that really helped me kind of put my creative hat on in terms of sexuality. Again, like we went from life drawing to photography events and the natural evolution for me was doing the video. So that was me kind of getting into every single kind of creative field I could do. So I got very, I got very experienced in, well, not very, but more experienced in filmmaking and what, so I would, I would write it, direct it, shoot it and edit it because I'm a bit of a micromanager and if I want something done right, I'll do it myself. You got to do it. (laughs) Well, then that sounds like at this point, then you're perfectly set up to go be an intimacy coordinator. Yes. (laughs) So then this job arrives. So then how did you go in and say, hey, I, I can do that. Throw me in. So I read this article about The Deuce, which is an mm-hmm. HBO show in New York that was about the rise of porn and sex work in the 80s in New York. And it had a lot of sexuality. And so the article was about how they brought in an intimacy coordinator to help the cast deal with how much nudity and sexuality that they had to be um, doing on set in order for them to be safe. So that article came out and I thought, oh my God, that's a thing? What? Why hasn't that been a thing? Shouldn't that have been a thing? You've got gun wranglers, child minders, animal wranglers, uh, like stunt coordinators for the safety of everybody else on set, but sexuality, which is one of the most intimate and can be actually quite dangerous if you're not doing it properly, parts of a scene. Why isn't there somebody there that is overseeing the protection? And I thought, oh, oh my God, I would be so great at this. <laughs> so I t- In I- retrospect, <laughs> duh. <laughs> So I mentioned it to my husband and he said, wow, who's a producer and had not heard of it either. Um, and he said, yeah, there, it absolutely should be a thing. I don't know why it's not been a thing. You should really try and check it out. So I was trying to get as much information as I could. And at the time, there really wasn't a lot uh, to find online other than, you know, the occasional article about the deuce. Mm-hmm. And then actually, now that I think about it, magically, serendipitously, I listened to your podcast on Amanda Amanda and Mm -hmm. so I thought oh my god she's got this podcast I'm an intimacy coordinator I have to listen to this because I did a google uh alert for intimacy coordinating for any time that it would show up in media because it was not showing up Uh, now if you do it it's like every other second something shows up so I listened to your podcast and Amanda uh, Blumenthal was on it and I thought oh my god this is so great and she had said on the podcast, kind of jokingly, well, there really aren't a whole lot of us. So if you know anybody, send them my way. And immediately after your podcast was done, I looked her up. I sent her an email and I said who I was. And perfect timing. Uh, you know, we had a conversation within the next couple of days. And she said, I'm actually doing a training cohort like in two months. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, my God, this is too good to be true. Please contact me in two months. And I was praying and praying and praying. I thought, oh, she might get too busy. Maybe she's not going to do another training cohort because she only had done one at the time and she'd only trained three people. And she herself was getting busy in work and becoming you know, a real intimacy coordinator. And she was getting calls all the time for work. And I thought, oh, she's not going to have time to do a training cohort. But she did. And, you know, I, you know, take my money. And and flew down between Toronto and LA a few times. Uh, again, some of the best times. I mean, Manhattan. I was in Hermosa Beach, which is such a lovely little part of LA. This cute little boutique hotel, and it was kind of like, okay, I'm here. I'm in LA, and I'm learning about intimacy coordination, and it's perfect. And it was like, it was all magic. And a lot of what I was, what was being taught in Amanda's course. Uh, really resonated. And I had, I already had known a lot about it because of the experience that I've had uh, becoming a sexual health educator in the last few years. So it was really great. And we, we really melded on how like the philosophy behind her course, because she's, she goes with kind of a sexual health, um, you know, the psychological aspect about performing sexuality or sexual violence and stuff like that, and really getting into consent and personal space and um, mental health of mental and sexual health of a performer. And that is totally what I would want an IC to do and to be. 
So her, her uh, specific training uh, for that uh, worked really well. So, uh, and I went, I flew through it. We did it in like six months. There was about, I think seven of us. And then because intimacy coordinating was becoming so popular, it really was like every time I was physically with Amanda, she'd get a phone call from a new producer saying, Hey, I hear you do intimacy coordinating. So that's a thing. Can you come on my show? So she was like scheduling every day new shows. And Canada, I know, I had known at the time, only had three trained from another agency, none trained from Amanda's agency, which is Intimacy Professionals Association. Uh, sorry, shameless plug um, <laughs> for you, for you LA peeps down there. Mm-hmm. So that I, Toronto, you know, it being a huge movie town, uh, could have really used it. I knew a lot of shows up here that uh, could really have used an intimacy coordinator. So I started cold calling people. I would be, I would look out, like on all the DGC list to see what was shooting in the next few months. And I would just look up the producers' names, send them an email, tell them who I am. Uh, what an intimacy coordinator, do, coordinator does because you know not a lot of people knew about it. And I am available if you would like to have a chat about intimate, intimate scenes in your film or television show. And I got some really nice calls back and I started getting work. And then uh, my husband, who has a writing agent, uh, said, you know what? I might need an agent. That might be pretty cool. So I called up his agent. I had a conversation with with his agent who's based in New York, who was here for Toronto International Film Fest. And he said, okay, this sounds really cool. And I think I'd really like to have a conversation with you. So I explained what it all was. And he said, that's amazing. Film production could really use something like that. I have to go back to my agency and see if they're all cool about repping intimacy coordinators. And I'll let you know. And then they called me back and said, yeah, we're going to do it. So between me cold calling and my agent uh, working, I was working immediately. So then I wound up being on two of the, (laughs) funnily enough, two of the biggest shows, productions in Toronto at the time, which is uh, Guillermo del Toro's Nightmare Alley. Toronto and Guillermo have this, you know, amazing love affair with each other. And um, Apple TV's uh, season two of C. And they were... That's a huge production. And so then I was thrown into like massive, you know, production, real production. Like me and my phone in a small room with (laughs) one performer is a little different than being on a production with like, you know, 800 background and 300 crew. And so, but because I was, you know, very well educated and, you know, being married to a producer for 20 years, you'll learn a lot and you visit a lot of sets and you know a lot of crew um, and you know what, you know, you know how a movie runs. Um, so I felt very comfortable right away. And it just, it was this perfect, perfect thing. And the funny thing is, is that I thought at the time, oh my God, I am so lucky. This is so perfect. It's too perfect. Something's gonna give. What could it? Something's gonna go wrong. I bet something's gonna go wrong. And then boom, COVID hits and all production shut down. Yeah. So, sorry, that's my long ramble about <laughs> intimacy coordinating. Oh my God, that was great. <laughs> okay, so here we are in the middle of COVID and also in the middle of Black Lives Matter movement. Mm-hmm. Like, everything happening all at once and the middle of in the u.s our presidential election cycle yeah well, what do you make of the whole thing <laughs> i think i said earlier 2020 such a shit show oh my god um and but you know there's the silver lining of as my husband says the squeaky wheel gets the grease so you know black lives matter movement making amazing headway in terms of defunding the police. And I am, I'm a proponent for defunding the police. You know, <laughs> Could you please explain what that means for the people who hear the word defunded and freak out and think people are talking about getting rid of police forces? Oh, yeah. No, it doesn't, uh, doesn't necessarily mean completely obliterating a police force. What it means is that reducing the funding that they get from the municipality and siphoning, taking that funding and put it into uh, better social programs and uh, community services. So if you've got something like, you know, a $1 billion police budget every year, you take, uh, I think that's Toronto's, uh, we were calling for defunding the police, which meant actually reducing their budget by 10% and taking that 10% and putting it into city and social services. So better community housing, affordable housing, uh, rec centers, uh, libraries, uh, public bathrooms, like just increase of social services because it has been proven time and time and time again that if you put money into those kind of services, crime drops. 
Yeah. Because people have something to do. And when people don't have something to do or they don't have work to go to, then, you know, things get a little messy. Um, and if you don't have, you know, proper services for people of color, po- people of color or immigration or, you know, in Canada and, of course, in the U.S., you know, indigenous, indigenous issues, which get such the short end of the stick when mm-hmm. it comes to funding uh, both provincial and federal. So defunding means taking some of that money, uh, putting it into programs and re- also reducing the number, the number of police that are actually on the street. You know, fewer boots on the ground, I think is what the, what the term is. You don't need that many people on the street. And you certainly don't need a police officer who is not trained. Uh, cops are not trained in um, psychological, sociological, or any kind of mental health. Um, those are not the people that you should call for an emergency that does not involve a violent crime. Um, and I can get into a whole thing about what crime actually is. But, um, you know, we, we had an issue up here and we had a big march in the middle of lockdown and we, we all went and it's like, it, this is worth going out in public with a whole bunch of people who were lovingly uh, spaced out and covered in masks and everything. But there was an issue of a young woman who was in a mental health crisis. Cops were called. Five cops show up and she winds up falling to her death uh, from a balcony. And a lot of people are saying, well, she had mental health issues. It doesn't, it doesn't matter when five cops show up to an apartment, do not let the rest of the family into the apartment. And that woman, that person who is in mental health crisis winds up dead because those cops are there. That's a number one sign that funding should go away from cops and towards mental health issues. Yeah. Do not have cops show up for those kinds of concerns and crises. You need to be funded. It doesn't end well. No, it never ends well. It really doesn't. And you're seeing it, especially in the US. Like, how many black young black men black women black trans women who are showing up dead because a a cop has somewhere shown up in the equation you know it's you know police involved shooting i'm sorry maybe you'll have to edit that edit this out but that's police murder yeah so we need to be looking at these in a very different thing so with all the shit that is happening maybe it it, it, unfortunately there are going to be a lot of lives lost and sacrifices but maybe this really is the big cultural shift that starts defunding the police and there have i think minneapolis defunded their i think it's disbanding their entire police department so all that all that noise that is being made and you have to make that much noise in order for it to get you know the little crumbs or the little starting stepping stones that will lead to a this is going to sound like very broad and and airy fairy but will lead to a better community and and a better society if we're not going to do it now, seriously, when, when are we going to do it? When are you going to do it when you have all this happening in, in a year? And COVID, like the lockdown is showing what can actually be happening totally fine when people aren't in the streets, when people aren't, you know, gathered in a work building. You know, we're learning we can work actually remotely. We don't need, you know, Silicon Valley to take over an entire city and, you know, increase the increase the property uh, taxes and po- and kick everybody else that can't afford those kinds of salaries, uh, can't afford those kind of rents or mortgages. You know, so we're seeing that people can can shift their work cycles. Um, we're seeing that we have to have increased funding to our medical facilities and our healthcare facilities and have to have better, um, emergency programs. We're, we just, we're not prepared. Like everybody keeps, uh, commenting about, you know, the last time we saw something so awful was the 1918 pandemic. Then we should have fucking learned over the last hundred years. <laughs> and we should be a lot more evolved. Um, right. so yeah, it's, it's. It's, I'm hoping to see a ton of change come out of this because a lot of people are saying, oh, I just want to get back to normal. But normal wasn't working for a whole lot of people. We need a new normal. Amen to that. <laughs> what advice do you have for people coming up behind you? Do your extra homework. You know, Read those books. Watch those and listen to those podcasts. Learn everything about sexuality, sexual health, um, the way that psychology works with sexual health. If you're training um, for an IC program, and there, are, you know, there are programs all over the place popping up now. Um, if you don't get it from the training, do your own work. And you know, I'm learning a lot because I have a background in uh, psychological counseling and sexual counseling. That a lot of the producers that I talk to are saying, you know what? I never actually thought about the psychological aspect, and it's kind of cool that you're getting into psychological counseling because I think some of my cast or even my crew could could really could really help with that or could really work well with that. So do as much as you can 
don't just do the minimum, fill up that resume, learn so much. The internet can be a real shit space, but can also be such an amazing place to learn stuff and listen to podcasts like, you know, the other 50% who I, I have to credit for me being an IC right now. I have to credit you, Julie Harris Walker, for where I am today. <laughs> I had no idea that happened and I'm so thrilled. That's so exciting. That's great. Where can people reach you? Um, they can reach me at my website, which is sjf, as in Frank Barnett, uh, dot com, or on Twitter at SJF Barnett, or on Instagram, which is like my pure intimacy coordinating. Intimacy coordinator 416. 416 is the Toronto area code. Wonderful. Is there anything I didn't ask you about that I should have asked you about? Uh, I'll just mention this if you have a question about it. I am adapting a queer, female, people of color, Canadian novel into a screenplay. So I think that's Ooh. really going to um, be very welcome in the new environment. And I'm also um, a volunteer uh, crisis text line responder. So it's helping people, uh, especially now, because so uh, yeah. with COVID and the lockdown, the crisis text lines were had like a 350% increase in calls and they needed people uh, to help those who are really feeling in crisis these days. Um, so I did my training and I'm doing that every week and it, it's kind of giving me my, my little extra while I'm not working, it's giving me my little extra uh, feeling of being able to help somebody somewhere. Thank you so much. This is such a delight to talk to you. Thank you so very much. And wow, I really hope that at some point I can take you out for drinks would that be great? And Let's you know, do that. you are such an amazing person. You do so much. And I would love to sit down and talk about you, not me. <laughs> uh, so yeah, if we're ever in the same city, and we can we can bring those little circles together and take it into drinks. We will do it. All right, fabulous. Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you. You've been listening to The Other 50%, A History of Hollywood. I'm Julie Harris Walker. I'd like to thank Sonia J.F. Barnett for sharing her story. And special thanks to Jay Rowey, Danny Rosner, and Allison McQuaid for the music. Please find us on your favorite podcast provider and leave a review. And of course, on our website, theother50percent.com, all spelled out in letters for added features, bios, and photos of our guests and the merch. You can also follow us on all the social media platforms. Thanks for listening. See you next time.